Thank you, fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'd like to present further evidence in support of the hypothesis which holds that the seed oils, the vegetable oils, are the primary drivers of overweight, obesity, and virtually all of our diseases of civilization, all of our westernized, westernized diseases. Um, heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, age-related macular degeneration, autoimmune disorders, the list goes on and on. Paracelsus dictum states that the dose makes the poison. And we're consuming these highly pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient deficient seed oils in massive quantities and consumption has spread all around the world. In fact, in the last 155 years, seed oil consumption has risen from zero to occupy more than half of our fat calories in many westernized populations. This is an infinite increase in consumption of the most highly processed, dangerous food on the planet. And I use the term food here loosely. And we're being told to eat more. In fact, we're being told to eat more by the Harvard School of Public Health, by Tufts University Nutrition Department, by Mayo Clinic's Nutrition Depart Department, the American Heart Association, Penn Medicine, Cleveland Clinic, and this list could go on and on. In fact, even the World Health Organization, unfortunately, still telling us to consume less than 10% of our calories as saturated fat and consume more seed oils, more unsaturated fats. So the question of the day, or maybe the question of the century in nutrition might be, are these the healthy fats, these, ve these uh, vegetable oils that are coming out of factories, really what many are calling factory fats, or are we just being misled? I mean, I think there's uh, numerous reasons to question this, perhaps not the least of which is the fact that the United States is the most obese nation in the world, right? And we've held this dubious honor for, for decades. We may also be the most unhealthy country in the world. I believe, in fact, that we are. So, but are we just sheep being led off the cliff? Is this where we're being led with this uh, advice from the, from the diet dictocrats and Harvard and such? Well, let's, so let's go back to this question. So why do the medical authorities and the diet dictocrats, Harvard, Tufts, why are they telling us to consume seed oils and not animal fats? And I, as far as I can tell through all the research, it really comes down to one thing, they lower cholesterol. Well, guess what? So does arsenic. <laughs> and you know, we may think this is a joke, and, 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 uh, but actually, incredibly, there's many parallels be, be, uh, between arsenic and seed oils, um, not the least of which is the fact that arsenic is fantastically oxidative, pro-oxidative, and this is exactly how seed oils get us. They drive the uh, oxidation, they're pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory and toxic, but of all of these, it is oxidation that is by far the worst and uh, this is what I want you to take notice of. Now, if it, back in my 2019 AHS uh, presentation, this conference two years ago, I go through all the biochemistry. I don't have time to do that today. But if you happen to want to go back and look at that, you'll see about the, uh, how oxidation uh, works with seed oils. Now, I don't have to do this, not for CME, but I just want to disclose I'm a book author, researcher and I'm the founder and president of Cure AMD Foundation. I do not accept compensation for any of these roles. I'm here just to try to figure out what is good nutrition and hopefully to, to spread a message that would be of benefit. Now, I'll, I will submit to you there's two fundamental drivers of obesity and chronic disease, and they are nutrient deficiency and toxicity. And, but there's a single source for this and it's processed foods. So if you flip this on its head, the processed foods are driving nu nutrient deficiency and toxicity. And I know this is a 50,000 foot view, but just to get to the big picture, and processed foods are defined by uh, refined flours, refined and added sugar, seed oils, and trans fats, as simple as that. Of course, there's mystery ingredients, engineered 
products, but primarily this is what uh, processed foods are. And of course, these foods, they line our grocery store aisles, and they're made primarily out of those four things, right? But what's most important here today is that it's the high poof of the highly polyunsaturated fatty acid vegetable oils that are the fat of choice for these processed foods. That's, that's what's in them, and they're in the, the restaurant foods, whether they be you know, fast foods like you see there, um, or typical restaurant foods. Even the finest restaurants are using seed oils because they're about one-sixth the cost of butter. Now, my charge to you today, seed oils are chronic biological poisons. They're not acute biological poisons, and this is how they've been able to, re to remain in the food supply. So they were brought in slowly, beginning in the 18, uh, 1860s, and uh, they were first used to adulterate lard and butter and then gradually they were uh, used to supplant and replace lard, butter, and beef tallow. And that's how they got away with this. And so we gradually became overweight and sick, and, uh, and, and they've kept them in the food supply that way. Now, they look nice and pretty like this, but all of the research tells us, without question, they're pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, thrombogenic, clot producing in other words, atherogenic, atherogenic producing atherosclerosis, and obesogenic, they are poisons. And again, you can go back to, uh, go back to 2019 AHS, my presentation there, for all the uh, biochemistry on that. Now I'm gonna walk you through 200 years of medical history here pretty quickly, and this is a review for some of you, uh, so I apologize if you've seen this. But the world's getting heavier, and the United States leads the way. And what I've seen many times in recent, you know, re the past decade or two, is this. It's blamed on the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, 1980, when we were told to go low fat. And the reason for that is because total energy intake did go up over that next decade, about 250 calories a day. And uh, then when you, you look at the macronutrient ratios, carbs went up, fat went down. And therefore, carbs are the problem, right? And so we, so, you know, we, carbs are going up. We think there's a problem. And so now I think the pendulum has swung. And now we think, you know, we need low-carb diets. I'm going to disagree here. And I'm going to say, for the most part, macronutrient ratios do not matter. It's the fat composition that matters. And you'll see here throughout this whole talk that the fat composition is what's changing. We're com continuing to replace and supplant animal fats with vegetable oils. Now, very quickly, I've done this before. Again, I apologize if you've seen this, but I'll just say quickly, heart disease, extreme medical rarity in the 19th century. There was eight papers on it. First published known heart attack in the US, 1912, James Herrick. Then 1930s, heart disease became the leading cause of death was virtually unknown 20 years before. By 2010, heart disease causes one out of three deaths. Uh, but a century before, practically unknown. All right, cancer deaths. Boston, 1811, cancer took one in 188 people. 1900 in the US, cancer took the lives of one in 17 people. Uh, 2010, again, it's almost one in three, 31.1%. So cancer in the last 200 years has increased 200 fold. How about diabetes? So we know diabetes was also a medical rarity in the 19th century. It was rising by 1935, 0.37%. This trend continues all the way to 10.5% by 2020. This is an 80, uh, I'm sorry, a 28-fold increase in diabetes in a period of 85 years. How about obesity? Now we know obesity was 1.2% in the 19th century. We know this from Scott Allen Carson's work. Um, by 1960, obesity is 13%. This is when we thought we were lean and healthy, right? But obesity had already risen 11-fold. Well, this trend continues again. <clears throat> uh, by 2015, we're at 39.8% obesity. This is a 33-fold increase in obesity in 115 years. And this trend continues upward. Metabolic syndrome was described in 1921, again in the 1940s and 50s. First called metabolic syndrome, 1981, and then we even called it syndrome X in 1988. Let's look at the numbers, though. Around 1990, 24% <clears throat> of U.S. adults diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. Night, uh, right around the turn of the century, 34.1%. 40% by 2006. 
and 88% of Americans cannot meet five criteria of metabolic health uh, by about 2009 to 16. So what is it that's so ubiquitous, so pernicious in our food supply that 88% of us are metabolically sick? And I, I want to show you today, it's seed oils, I believe. How about macular degeneration? Less than 50 cases in all the world's literature between 1851 and 1930 when it was first discoverable. Today, 196 million cases. So this increase is, uh, is at least in the thousands. All right, again, looks like this. Um, very quickly, knee osteoarthritis doubled in the, in the 20th century. And I'll just have to move quickly here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so here's the curve. As you can see, a uh, fantastic increase in osteoarthritis as well. So we're, let's talk about uh, dietary history here quickly. And I believe this is a global human experiment for which no one gave consent. Nobody saw this coming. Uh, they wouldn't have signed up for it. But it's really those four foods again. So refined sugars. Um, Stephen Guinea, Guinea showed that between 1822 and 1999, sugars went up 17-fold. Um, Cottonseed oil, introduced in 1866, and then that was followed by soybean oil in 1909. And then we got all the other oils. And then these just began to overtake and supplant the animal fats, lard, butter, and beef towel, essentially. We got roller mill technology, which gave us refined wheat in 1880. Then Procter & Gamble introduced Crisco, trans fats, 1911. That's it. That's processed foods in a nutshell, right there. And uh, so Weston Price connected these food, these very foods, essentially, to uh, physical degenerative disease, 1939, nobody listened. 2009, our own USDA shows where 63% of the American diet is ultra-processed food, and 75% of the world's diet is now processed, same as the US, processed, uh, that much processed food, and, and chronic disease looks like that curve right there. And, if you, and, and this is essentially from the USDA, except with the vegetable oil plugged in from our own published data, 32%, and I'll come back to that. But that's the, all the red there is the processed food, so we've got 29% of the diet made up of real whole food, and even that is coming from CAFO-raised animals. So the vegetable oils, <clears throat> just so we're on the same page, better term seed oils, since they almost all come from seeds, and one of them, soybeans from beans, but they have all these names, the latest, greatest of which uh, is the so-called plant oils. I think that another euphemism to make them sound really nice. Um, this is on my most dreaded list, the high uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid oils, soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. I think these are the worst of the worst for many reasons. So have to stick with big picture here. There are details here I wish we could get into, but we don't have time. These oils, though, they're hidden fats. People tell, tell us all the time they're not pouring any of these oils into their foods, and yet they're getting boatloads of these because they're hidden in the food through the processed foods and the restaurant foods. So you don't have to spoon any of these into your foods to get 80 grams a day. This is also our <clears throat> published data. You can see uh, seed oils introduced in 1866 in the American diet. By 2010, we're at 80 grams per person per day. 80 grams is 720 calories. It's 32% of US caloric intake. And I want you to notice, in 1900, 99% of the added fats in the diet were animal fat, lard, butter, and beef tallow. By 2005, 86% of added fats came from vegetable oils. This is all published. It's all scientifically published. Go back here to the Dietary Guidelines 1980. Remember, fat's going down, but the vegetable oils continue to rise. They continue the ascent unabated. Now, it didn't just happen in the US. Developed countries, vegetable oils, just between 1963 and 2003, they doubled. Developing countries, they tripled. Japan, for example, four and a half fold increase. China, about an eight fold increase. So what does this do to our omega-6? Well, all of this blue here from the fifth one down on these added fats, all this that I circled in red here, that's all the uh, omega-6 we're getting from all these oils, essentially. Um, again, big picture. I don't have time to get through the date. Uh, through all the details. But if you, draw, if you transplant yourself back to 1865, this is primarily where our omega-6 would have come from, butter, lard, and beef tallow at 3, 2, and 2% 2 respectively, because that's what the 
uh, omega-6 linoleic acid would be in ancestrally raised animals. Now, CAFO-raised animals, completely different. CAFO-raised pork could be 20-some percent omega-6, just like in humans, monogastric animals, they, um, they accumulate this in their, in their fat, just like humans. So where were we? 1865, 2.2 grams of omega-6 in our diet per day is what we've calculated. That's about 1% of calories or a little less. By 1909, we're at 2% of calories or 4.84 grams uh, uh, linoleic acid per day. 1999, 18 grams a day or 7% of calories. And 2008, an incredible 29 grams a day of linoleic acid alone. 11.8% of calories and climbing. This is a 12-fold increase in omega-6 in a period of about 150 years. So this is really all you need to know, this right here. This is what happened. And you can look at it here. As you'll see, this is our published data, vegetable oils in the black versus uh, heart disease deaths in the red. You can see the remarkable correlation there. And of course, saturated fat is flat over the 20th century no correlation at all to heart disease. Now, people ask, well, why, are heart, why is heart disease going down? Coronary procedures, bypasses, and all that. Now, this is from uh, Roger Horowitz, published data. This is total meat, red meat, and poultry uh, consumption. Um, you see the three curves there, and you can see that over the entire 19th century, uh, meat consumption, including red meat, was going down, and it reached a nadir um, around 1930, but this is back in the period when coronary heart disease was virtually unknown. And then when we reached the nadir of meat consumption is when coronary heart disease became the leading cause of death in the U.S. So there's all sorts of populations that, that we know don't really have any heart disease or any appreciable level of heart disease. I named 19th century Americans, as you've seen, the Chimani of, of Bolivia, the Ashe of Paraguay, the Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania, the two, uh, uh, Papua New Guineans of Tukacenta, Tokelauans and Catavans. We'll look at three of these very quickly. Um, again, I've done this before. I'll make this very fast. This is the Maasai tribe of Kenya and Tanzania. They were studied by George Mann and colleagues in 1972. Their diet is mostly milk, meat, and blood, especially the Muran cohort. Ages about 14 to 34, they, are, they can only consume milk, milk, meat, and blood. It was about 3,000 calories a day, 66% animal fat. That's 33 to 45% saturated animal fat. It turns out to be 1.7% omega-6. Now, I put this in red, omega-6 LA, linoleic acid only. Again, they had no heart, no heart disease. They had one possible silent MI in the group. Again, but our American Heart Association continues to tell us to consume no more than five to six percent of our calories is saturated fat. All right, so again, 66 percent animal fat, but 1.7 percent omega-6 because they had no seed oils, right? Americans are consuming on the lowest end 24 percent, and on the highest end 32 percent of their calories is vegetable oils. What does that give them? Eight to 12 percent or higher omega-6, linoleic acid alone, right? So total omega-6 would be even a little bit higher. And remember, that last data was 2008. It's higher than that today. So here's toke allowance. A couple of pictures from many years gone by. But these are, these are very healthy people, as you, you might witness here. In these pictures, they were studied by uh, Pryor and colleagues in, in the 1970s and published in the 80s. Um, their diet is very different. Coconut, starchy tubers, star uh, fish, and fruit. Um, it's uh, most of the calories coming from coconut oil. 53% fat, 48% saturated fat, published, all published, 2% of the diet is total PUFA. So that's omega-6 and omega-3 together. That means their omega-6 is around 1%, maybe less. Um, but 1982, none of them had any heart disease in this study, and they noted no, virtually no diabetes or obesity. Fantastically healthy people. This study, Papua New Guineans of Tukacenta and the Highlanders, their the sweet potatoes account for over 90% of their calories in this study by Senate White that was published, that came out in uh, 1973. They would occasionally feast on pork and chicken. Um, it has been argued that perhaps they didn't uh, recognize how, you know, that they were eating more pork and chicken than they did, but nevertheless, it was ancestrally raised animals. Um, 
Their diet in this paper, 94.6% carb, it turns out to be about 0.6% omega-6. There's that number again I want you to pay attention to. This is what Sinnott and White said about them in their published study. Population was lean, physically fit, and in good nutri nutritional state. Absence of obesity and hypertension, no diabetes or gout. Ischemic heart disease was rare, if not absent, and they had no macular degeneration. I think it was 340 people in this study. So if we look at these populations, and you can look at all of the ancestrally living populations, what they don't have is refined sugar, refined wheat, processed foods, and of course they don't have vegetable oils. Those only come from big food manufacturing and these huge plants that produce these oils. Um, so the, what about the omega-6 LA in these traditional populations? It is 0.6 to about 1.7%. I think they're all under 2% uh, to the best of my knowledge, but where are westernized populations? 7 to 12% omega-6 linoleic acid alone. This, again, is the key uh, takeaway point. So what happens to this omega-6? We accumulate it in our body fat. Um, uh, uh, all monogastric animals do this. And so, and this is from Stefan Guillenet's published uh, research collating 37 studies between 1959 and 2008 of the omega-6 linoleic acid in the body fat of humans. Um, and you can see we were at 9.1% LA in 1959, up to 21.5% LA by 2008. Um, and you're going to see here, this is where the toke allowance, who are consuming all the the 53% fat diet, which, but, which is mostly saturated fat from coconut oil, there's where their omega-6 linoleic acid was in their body fat, 3.8%. It's off the chart low, which is where it should be for an ancestral population. And here I plugged in what the body fat was in comparison to obesity. You see it's, uh, there's a, uh, a linear correlation. And here it is uh, in relation to vegetable oils. So um, what approximately happens is that whatever the linoleic acid is in your diet, if it's 10%, you'll increase that in your body fat if you consume it for a long period of time to approximately double to two and a half. So if you're, you get 10% LA in your diet, you'll, your body fat will probably be 20 to 25%. This will set off the pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and of course, nutrient deficient cascade resulting in all of this harm. Now, if, if you think carbs are the problem in obesity, then you'll need to explain this also from Stefan Guillenet. Why is obesity going up still with, uh, with carbs going down since the late 1990s? And if you think that it's about sugar, we have a similar situation. Since the late 1990s, sugar is going down, obesity is still on the rise, right? But of course, as I keep saying, seed oils continue the ascent. It hasn't stopped. And this is from my colleague, Kate Shanahan. Um, you see seed oils here over the last century continuing uh, to climb. And here's diabetes and prediabetes uh, collectively um, on the same kind of vertical ascent. But notice the carbs down here, practically flat over the last century. Now, here I just put the, uh, these two uh, plots together. Um, so you can see that sugar's falling while diabetes and prediabetes escalate. So if you think sugar is the cause of diabetes, you also need to explain this. I don't believe it is. I believe it's primarily seed oils. Now, I'm not defending uh, large amounts of sugar in the diet. All right, I'm just trying to uh, put the perspective here. So let's look at this same question, high-carb diets uh, driving obesity and chronic disease in the case of Japan because Japan may have once been the healthiest of all nations. It's home to the Okinawans, as you know, the, uh, at least at once the longest live, lived people on the planet. Um, they once had the lowest obesity in the world, as you're going to see here. Um, it was, uh, here's obesity in Japan, 1976. Now, this is when they called obesity BMI of 30, which they eventually changed in Asian, since they're so much leaner than we are naturally. But uh, back here, uh, obesity, 70, 1976, men 0.7%, women 1.5%. And, 1 and uh, if we look at heart disease here, you're all going to love Ansel Keys. 
uh, me bringing that up here. I'm sure his sixth country study, 1953, but he didn't make up the data, all right? So, so uh, but you see Japan down here amongst the very lowest in degenerative heart disease. Um, and in case you don't buy that, for any reason, Gershalmi and Hillebo republished the 22 country study in 1957, as you all probably also know. And you can see, again, mortality in Japan from heart disease way down there. The only country that was uh, at least appreciably lower was Mexico, and that data was not determined to be very good. So Japan was very, very healthy by all accounts, I think. Um, and then they had this decline in health. And I want to show you this. You can see the increasing obesity. Again, this is still with uh, BMI uh, 30, so we'll come back and look at this as, uh, as things have progressed. Um, but let's look at their health, too. So this is what we see between 1958 and 1999. You see their diastolic blood pressure climbing from 73.5 to 82.0. Hypertensive medications in this period went from 3% to 20%. Their body mass index went from 21.7 to 23.7, twofold BMI points increase between 1958 and 1999, and their smoking went from 68.5 to 45.2%, so smoking went quite a ways down. Um, this is a paper on diabetes in Japan, and the authors said this, in Japan in particular, the prevalence of diabetes has increased from 6.9 to 8.9 million between 1997 and 2007, so in that single decade alone, diabetes increased 61%. And then they went on to say the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in, Jap in Japanese population is not dramatically lower than that in Western population, like us. This is about diabetes in children and adolescents in Japan. And they say this, the incidence of type 2 diabetes among Japanese primary school children in Tokyo increased tenfold between 1976 and 1995 alone. And in junior high school children, incidence of type 2 diabetes um, it almost doubled in approximately the same period. How about metabolic syndrome in Okinawa? Back in 2003 and 4, this is what the author said from this paper. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome was 30.2% in men and 10.3% in women in Okinawa, 2003 and 4. And half of the men aged over 40 are obese in Okinawa, 2003 and 4. They've lost their longevity as well, their position as the number one in longevity, even in Japan. Um, so uh, with regard to cancer, um, what, here's what we see in Japan. Now there's been two cancers that went down, stomach cancers down, presumably due to refrigeration and H. pylori treatment. Cervical cancers down, presumably due to uh, early detection. But cancers of the breast, colon, lung, and rectum all markedly increased in this time frame. This is by year 2000. They say, this is what these authors say. Obesity has become a public health problem in Japan. Pre-obese, 24.5% of males, 17.8% of females. And then from this paper, this is overweight and obese men. Between 1980 and 2012, you can see all categories climbing in obesity. And uh, here's the latest numbers in Japan. Um, over 32% of Japanese men and 22% of women now overweight. So since 1960, Japan's had marked increases in pre-obesity and obesity, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, multiple cancers, age-related macular degeneration, which I'll get to momentarily, um, and even myopia, nearsightedness, and a number of other disorders we just don't have time to get to. But So let's look what happened to their food. Now, from this paper, this is the most shocking thing, uh, I think, to most of us. This is what they say, results. The total daily energy intake decreased from 2837 kilocalories in 1958 to 2202 kilocalories in 1999. And then, quote, the carbohydrate intake and percentage of total daily energy uh, uh, intake decreased markedly from 84% in 1958 to 62% in 1999, in contrast to large increases during this period in protein intake from 11% to 18% and fat intake from 5% to 20%. So, and here you see the data from this paper. 
There's the energy from 2837 down to 2202. You see a progressive decrease in their energy. They had all the food they wanted to eat in 1958. It wasn't that way in 1950, so I didn't uh, use any of that data. But here, here's the fat consumption, 5% in 1958 to 20% by 1999. And here's the carbs, 84% to 62%. And I want you to, in case you're wondering where all the carbs came from, look at the white rice, 593 grams in 1958. That's over, well over 2,000 calories a day in white rice alone. And 1999, they're 236 grams, so their white rice uh, less than halved and yet their health is declining, right? This is calorie intake in Japanese men between 1997 and 2011. And, the re and uh, uh, I'll come back to that momentarily. And I just want to point out here, because some people might say, well, what happened to the fruits and vegetables? You can see in the bottom curve there, the, uh, the vegetables is practically flat during this period. Fruits have gone up. Fruits have gone up more than double in recent decades. Um, now, Okiyama and uh, colleagues and uh, these Japanese researchers, they get this. Medicines and vegetable oils as hidden causes of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. You'll see it from their, their graph here. You can see the total energy in the top in blue going down uh, over all these decades and carbohydrates going way down. But down in the, in the green at the bottom, toward the bottom, look at the lipid energy. That's seed oils all going up, right? And look at the diabetes, it is through the roof. Now, I brought you back to this. This is Jap uh, Japanese overweight and obese men in Japan. And I brought you back to this graph because I laid in here the exact calorie intake year for year, same years. And you'll see the calorie intake is going down as the obesity goes up year for year. Now, this is exactly what we see in the animal studies with, on isochloric diets. Animals given seed oil, more and more seed oils become more and more obese, even given the same exact calories as other animals not given seed oils. Now, I'm going to take you back to 1949, 1950 with this paper and this number right here. You see the, the, uh, in Okinawa and Japan, they're only getting three grams of oils per day. All right, three grams a day. This is where Americans were in 1900. We were at 18 grams a day by 1949 and 80 grams a day by 2010, just for perspective. All right, so this is all the data kind of tabulated to put these numbers together. So carbs went from 84% from to 56% between about 1960 and 2005-ish. Fat from five to 27%. Saturated fat still only 7%, one of the lowest in the world in developed nations. Seed oils, though, from three grams a day in 1950 to 39 grams a day by 2004. Omega-6, one and a half and 1% in 1950 and 60, up to 6.2% by 2004. That's the main problem right there. And all that omega-6 coming from their seed oils, which you're gonna see right here. So this is sort of the big kahuna. This is our data, uh, uh, which will come out in our next paper. So between 1960 and 2004 in Japan, calories down 31%, carbs down 28%, fat is up 440%, seed oils are up 333%. Saturated fat only 7%, and omega-6 up 520%. So back here in, in 1960, when the carbs were 80 plus percent, Japan's healthy. But look where their seed oils were, nine grams a day. Over here in the, about 2000, Japan's overweight and sick, but where's their seed oils approaching 39 grams a day. Now, this is macular degeneration. It was 0.2% in the 1970s. 2013, 16.37%. Okay, so this is an 82-fold increase in macular degeneration prevalence in response to a 13-fold increase in seed oil consumption. And in 1999, in Japan, seed oils provided 76% of the total fat calories. Three-fourths of their, calorie, their fat calories coming from seed oils. This is the recipe for disaster. So, with increasingly lower carbs and higher fat, with up to 76% of that fat coming from seed oils, Japan has an marked increases in pre-obesity and obesity, four major cancers, hypertension, 
type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, macular degeneration, and a reduction in longevity. So, how can we conclude low-carb diets are necessary, either for health or for weight loss? Their carbs went way down. Their fat went up. But it's the composition of the fat that matters, not how much. So, this is a, just a quiz question. So Japan's declining health is most likely due to A, a 13-fold, 1,200% increase in highly pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient-deficient seed oils, or B, an approximate doubling of fruit. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it's, a it's a tough call. I've been pondering this a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards A, the, the seed oils. So we're going to ask the same question on a global scale. High-carb sugar diets, are they the cause of obesity and chronic disease? Let's look at this really quickly. Just, uh, just so we've said it, we know the whole world's getting, becoming more overweight, right? 1975, 1 in 20 people globally were obese. Today, almost 1 in 7. It's 13%. This is an increase in the chronic disease deaths, up 4.1% in 26 years. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that's millions of additional deaths, all right? And that from this uh, book, uh, uh, I just have to go quickly here. Chronic diseases are the leading causes of death and disability worldwide. Disease rates from these conditions are accelerating globally, advancing across every region, and pervading all socioeconomic classes. Let's look at what happened with um, their nutrition, the, the whole world's carbohydrate nutrition. So this is the, um, uh, let me go back here. Sorry, this is from the FAO, uh, paper number 66. And um, this is the, their raw data, and that's too much to digest here quickly. So I've broken this down easily. But you can see in developed countries between 1964 and 1994, where I've highlighted, carbs went down 8.9% in this 30-year period. In developing countries, same period of time, carbs went down 4.9%. In the whole world, 1964 to 1994, carbs went down 3.1%. Now, I want you to notice, 1964, when the world was really quite healthy, fantastically more healthy and less overweight than they were today, carbs were 66.3% of the diet. What about sugar? Same time frame. Here's sweeteners, 12.9% in 1964 to 13.5% by 1994. So sugars went up 32 calories. Um, that's 0.6% in 30 years. Now, we've got data up to 2007 on carbs. Here's the numbers. 64.5% in 1964 to 63.1% in 2007. So in this period of time, carbs are down 1.4%. So this is um, vegetable oil production for the world. And we see back here in 1961, we we're at 15 and a half grams a day. By 1994, 33.6 grams per day. 2014, 65.4 grams per day. So while carbs went down during this period, 1.4%, seed oils went up 322%. This is all oils, all right? There's some good ones in there, but this is the total. Now, if we, I just scaled this graph down to show you this. If you went, walk back to 1865, seed oils would have been pre almost precisely zero. That's where we would have been. And, but this is where they, they've gone and where they're still going. Chronic diseases are following. All right, so we're at, by 2014, 173.26 million tons of production of seed oils. That works out to be about 382 billion pounds of oils in 2014 alone. It was about zero in 1865. So that's an infinite increase in seed oil consumption in about 155 years. What about global sugar consumption? It was 45.2 grams a day in 1966, 63.4 grams a day by 2014. Sugars are up 40.3%, nothing to sneeze at. I don't like this either, but it's, it's really only 18.2 grams or about four teaspoons a day. So, uh, so if we look at from 1961 to 2014, carbs went down 1.4%, sugars up 40.3%, seed oils up 322%. Let's put this into teaspoons. So this is what it is if you calculate it per capita per day. 11 teaspoons of sugar per day in the world, 1966. 
15 teaspoons per day by 2014. So is the global obesity and chronic disease epidemic due to an increase of four teaspoons of sugar a day, 18.2 grams? I just don't think so. But would it be more likely this? Vegetable oil production in 1961 was three and a half teaspoons a day per person. 2014, about 15 teaspoons per person per day. So I'm going to go back to this. Is, is the U.S. the most obese nation in the world? Absolutely. Of course we are. So let's find out the seed oil consumption in relation to the rest of the world. Here we are. U.S. has the highest seed oil consumption in 171 countries. There's only 24 countries left out because they couldn't have, didn't have any data for those. So um, half of us, it looks like we'll be obese by 2030. But what's still going up? As I said, seed oils. Vietnam has the lowest rate of adult obesity in the world. And here's the data, 2.1% obesity. So um, let's look at their vegetable oil consumption, second lowest in 171 countries. It's 7.5 grams per day. This is where the US was in about 1908. So um, is the United States the most unhealthy country in the world? I believe so. But what is the most healthy? And this is from a study. They're just reviewing. They named Afghanistan. With, you may love it or not. But let's look at their seed oil consumption. Here it is. They're the eighth lowest in the world for where they have data. Nine and a half grams per person per day, where we were precisely in 1909. All right, so hard to find an overweight or obese person in Afghanistan. But just today, I just want to review quickly here. These are the populations we hit and their carb percentages, the Maasai and their health, 17% carb, excellent health. Toke allowance, 24%, excellent health. Uh, Japan, 80% in 1960, health was excellent. Okinawans, 85%, their health was excellent. And Tukacenta, 94.6%, you can argue that, but it's published data, health was excellent. Um, so it's, so I, I really believe that macronutrient ratios play little, if any, role, pretty much the same as what Weston Price found in the 1930s. Processed foods are the problem, and of those, I think seed oils are the big, big drivers. So why do low-carb diets work? And I, and I've sh I showed this once before. Um, this is the food sources of linoleic acid in the American diet. I'm going to highlight all those that are um, high carb. And I'll read them to you. Chicken mixed dishes, grain-based desserts, potato, corn, other chips, pizza, yeast breads, fried white potatoes, pasta and pasta dishes, Mexican mixed dishes, quick breads, and popcorn. And the point of this, it's the high carb foods that the seed oils run with. So when people are going low carb, they're getting rid of a lot of seed oils, and they don't really know it. That's what they're doing. So I, I would submit. We want to make sure everybody has a break, so I don't want to. Okay. I mean, Or I have about three minutes to go. So. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Very quickly. Okay. So, you, so the, you can make the seed oils look pretty, but they're a lot like arsenic. They're driving oxidation. And I'll submit to you that what's coming out of these refineries is poisons. 80% um, of the problem, I believe, is uh, driven by vegetable oils. So how do we consume 1% omega-6? Again, you've got to get the seed oils out of your diet, the processed foods and the fast foods and all that. The Maasai warriors, their diet, 100% animal fat, essentially. Uh, Americans, 86% of added fats, vegetable oils. Um, and another way to look at this is they're on a 0% vegetable oil diet in Maasai. I want, if I could, I'll show you this video very quickly. New York City, 1911, some of the earliest video ever recorded uh, in the US. And I just want you to notice, look at these people all over. And you can watch this for a long time, and you can hardly ever find an overweight or obese person. The point I want to make of this, though, is the fact that these people didn't know anything about nutrition. They didn't know. They, they, Vitamins hadn't even been theorized until the next year after this was taken, 1912, by Casimir Funk. They didn't know what saturated fats or monounsaturated or omega-6. They didn't know any of this, right? They just ate the food that was in the food supply, uh, and um, they ate, uh, they ate uh, bacon and eggs and pancakes for breakfast, and they ate lots of steak. It was a heavily meat-based diet. 
Refrigeration was not available until 1913 in homes, and so they didn't have a lot of fruits and vegetables, um, which is why they ate a lot of meat, potatoes, and bread, twice as much wheat consumption as we do today. But what didn't they have? For 45 years prior to this, they had no more than two grams of seed oils in their diets per day. And uh, back to this, so 86% added fats, vegetable oils, right? But these people are innocent victims. It's not their fault. They're doing what the diet dictocrats are telling them to do. Um, we can't blame them. I mean, this little girl, look at this. And this, these are innocent victims. It's a tragedy and it's a travesty because it's preventable. These are all victims of this. And again, but I want to finish here on a high note. This is 100% animal fat diets. You could look at hundreds, thousands of pictures of the Maasai and their videos, and this is what they look like. Um, and again, 66% animal fat diet, but 0% seed oils. And again, I'll end on this one the, uh, with the 100% of their diet, uh, their, their fat coming from animal fat. Um, I represent Cure AMD Foundation, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Aaron Blaisdell and the whole AHS team, and I want to thank all of you. It is an honor and a pleasure. Thank you.